Hi, my name is Cheryl Potoki, Potatsky. Um, and one of the, actually, let me see if I can minimize this little guy here. There we go. Um, I went to the, there we go. Uh, I went to the Mindy workshop this summer with um, Victoria and Tova. And one of the activities that was presented was the spread of a common cold by Cor Corbin Harwood. And um, I thought, wow, this is really great. Um, in my differential equations class uh, and, and also in my BC calculus class, uh, we, one of the units in, is in differential equations uh, unit in there. And we, we use the logistic function to and solve the differential equation that yields to a um, logistic function. And I had an activity that I used, but I thought, oh, this is so much better. And I th started thinking, what could I do to make it more um, pertinent to the school where I teach? And, and we're a, um, we are a charter school, we're a math science STEM school, and it's, it's by choice, you have to you know, apply to come in. And I wanted something that would, um, as I said, hold their interest. Um, but I also teach other levels of mathematics and, and some of our students that come to our school uh, don't have, maybe their middle school did not provide them with the opportunity for the best math, math background. And so we need to um, teach them some more things and, and, and help kind of uh, scaffold them for the rest of the math curriculum we're trying to take them through. So I started thinking, well, we do teach logistic functions and pre-calc, it is something that, that's a function using E. Um, obviously I need it for the BC. And then I also have a math modeling elective. It's math modeling with differential equations. And we have a unit on population models that I, I put in. And I thought this was a nice way to go past, um, you know, it's not just unbridled expon exponential growth. And then we, you know, you have the M and M activity that we use to, to show the, um, coming back, you know, kind of regaining your population from immigration, and that leads to an integrating factor. And then using um, the idea of enclosed exponential growth in an enclosed population, so you, you get the logistic curve. I want the situations that create that. And then I have uh, projects that the kids can jump off to using the Gompertz model and some of the other population models that have been developed. So, um, what I do is replace our, the dorm, the um, Harwood version has a dorm floor plan from a university in Colorado. I forget which one it is, but it's, it's a, a rectangular one hallway down the center. Our school is essentially a square. And although this drawing isn't quite proportional, um, for example, the office, while it contains those many different sub offices, it is not the same size as the three classrooms in the rest of the hallway. Um, but it gives the, the uh, student who actually made that uh, was trying to you know, accommodate all the different things. We do have the square with two dog legs, the upper left-hand corner, 327, 29, 31, that's our physics uh, wing. And then the right side, top right corner, the 312 through 315 is our chemistry wing. Um, and again, it's not quite to scale, but at least the kids get a sense of the building as we know it. Um, for the creek, Pre-calc version, I wasn't really interested in using the derivative per se. I was trying to get a, a useful model for the logistic function and how uh, epidemiology works in terms of trying to model the spread of something. And um, so using the floor plan, I thought would be really good. The other thing I wanted to teach them, um, it's in the context also of learning how to solve a, an exponential equation for the coefficient as well as the, um, in, in the exponent, as, as well as your initial condition and using that to find all the different parts of the model. I also try to show the kids how to do an eyeball model. And, and that's just to give a sense of kind of, is your answer you calculated reasonable? So if I can make an eyeball model, then I have something to compare to. And then I like to have the kids run a regression model just again, so they have something else they can compare to and discuss, well, what do they think is the best model? Um, for their version for this group, um, I actually had the kids experiment. They did different runs of the data collection using different locations for the initial condition. In other words, does it make a difference 
Come on, go back here. Does it make a difference if you start out up in the corner versus somewhere on the square? And so that gave them something to kind of investigate. So this is data from one of my students sets, and we actually did this in uh, October. And one of the things I found in trying to adjust it for their class, I was trying to figure out a way to, to address the change. Um, I was hoping that the data would, uh, you know, at this point where your inflection point is roughly, I was hoping that there would be this nice little increase in the differential and then it would go down. Well, because I was trying to adjust it for the students and what their math experience was at that time, it didn't quite work. They were just graphing delta y and that was all over the place. So I was hoping for something a little bit more quadratic looking. And, but that's okay. We, uh, since that part didn't work out, you know, you go to plan B and I said, all right, looking at the data you've collected, um, where would you expect the rate of change to be greatest? And so they were able to look at the graph and, and kind of come up with that conclusion because I'm trying to avoid telling them. I would like them to be able to discover and think and figure it out. Um, and, and with some questioning, they can do that. Okay, for BC, as I said, I, my first thought was, oh, I can use this for BC. And one of the things that I find with our BC students, sometimes people assume because they are, uh, have a greater math background when they start our curriculum. There's this idea that they don't need our help very much as teachers, that we can just throw them information and they'll do just fine and pop it back out on the AP exam later in May. And I, I just think that's a real disservice to them as learners. And it also um, prevents them from really enjoying the applications of calculus that we, we find in the calculus and ultimately in DEQ. Um, so I took um Harwood's form and um adjusted it so that we had like a part one and the part one was they gather the data they look at the plot and they see the their sigmoid um and then I asked them questions to try and get them to create the differential equation first because what I wanted to do was have the activity motivate the need to use the, the technique of partial fractions in order to solve the differential equation. Um, and then after they've learned that, that they can get, they go back and solve the model that they've made and, and see if it fits the data. So this is Anna's. And Anna's, I included hers of all the different ones because it showed a couple things. So first of all, her orange data is Y versus T. And in her case, her data set she reached her carrying capacity and, and stopped. So when she was trying to calculate her model, so the green one is her calculated model, it implies that the carry, you know, it, it kind of, she knew the carrying capacity was 37. So she put that in there and then she calculated her K and her, her B value. And so she came up with this. When you do the regression model that Desmos has, it came up with this graph up here because she didn't fix the carrying capacity of 37, it assumed that this data had not plateaued yet. So um, as the um, Mark from Australia, I think spoke yesterday about some of the, sometimes the algorithms that the regression programs are using don't give you what you're expecting, they don't do it correctly. And I think this is a nice example of that. It's interpreting this as has not plateaued. Um, but I ran into the same problem. Um, we grafted delta y versus t, and why my brain didn't adjust that because I did this a little bit after um, the other group had. And I could oh wait, put it back. Um, so we got this, and she was trying to model it. She was trying to figure out well, what kind of model is this? And I again, ideally, you know, you're looking for a quadratic, but that's not what happened. Hers was linear. So. Uh, again, I think the nice thing about data, though, it, it, it's messy. You don't always get what you expect, and that's okay. And so she was trying to make the most logical sense out of what the data was presenting her. Um, so lastly, my math modeling class with differential equations, and we, my students literally did that this week. Um, this is, you know, we're in our population model uh, unit, rather. And so we used um, Harwood's write up as is. 
And um, I do kind of supplement some of the questioning in the analysis part, but um, it allows me to, once, once we have collected data and we can look at both the face um, portrait as well as some of the other topics now that I can discuss because we have a graph to look at them. Um, and also the, the revisit the technique, the partial fraction technique, because they all took BC with me, except for one. Um, and so we can kind of work with the different topics that go in there as well as these things. Now, the nice thing about this is I had my head together and mm -hmm. they collected the data. In fact, I think um, I'll pull his up in a moment. Um, Zev and Jack did collected this data and I was able to grab, so we have two things here. The green points are Y versus time. And so we have a nice sigmoid. The blue data is using the method that um, Corbin suggested in his handout to actually take, calculate delta Y over delta T, but use the average. And what that means is you take the two consecutive points and take the average delta Y over that interval. So you have a better sense of delta Y over delta T. Um, and although it is discrete, at least it gives a, a better sense of the relationship. So this is actually the differential equation. Cause if you look at um, graph dy dt versus y, this is our differential equation and this is where it comes from. So even though it's the phase portrait, it actually is showing the autonomous equation that is the differential equation. Um, and you have to play around with the variables and the tables a little bit to get Desmos to graph what you want it to, but it, it will do it. So the other thing I liked about this was um, while not perfect, and again, no data set is, but by using the phase portrait, we can show that the K value or the rate of change of the number of people infected is consistent from the differential equation to the parent model of the solution. And I like that as well. Um, I did, we fixed the carrying capacity to 48. Um, I could have fixed the B value should have based on the initial condition. I think for theirs was two for this one, but, and then that, that way it would only be dependent on the K. So I don't know that may have affected um, the K value to make it a little bit more consistent, but in this way, at least I like that. It shows me what we were looking at. Um, and just to kind of give an idea, this is their spreadsheet. So they have the number of the round, the number of susceptible people, the number that were infected, the delta Y and then dy dt, which is actually, like I said, split in two. So it's the average of the two. Okay, let me stop the share. So um, lessons learned. Sometimes when you're adjusting, it doesn't work out the way you want it to and you have to go back and do it again, um, but that's okay. I like the, the nice thing about it is I can actually take the graph back and, and you know, show the kids. So for my uh, AP class, I can, hey, and when we did it again, this is what we get. And then they can see it and I'll see them go, oh yeah, okay. Um, we're pretty nerdy um, and that's okay. I teach them to embrace their inner nerd. And so my students, um, I was telling them where I, you know, I had to leave early in order to come home during the week to, to start in the afternoon. And they said, oh, what are you talking about? And I told them, and they said, oh, you're going to use the, the cold thing? Yes, I'm going to use the cold. Like, okay, that was fun. That's a good one. So, okay, if the kids liked it, they had a success there. So. That's awesome. That sounds like a lot of fun for them. And it's cool to see the three different levels of the course. Yeah, and I, I like that it... Too. It, it's nice to be, I, I know many of the kids are going to go into different STEM fields. And so they're going to have to take differential equations somewhere anyway. And I think it's a good setup for them in there. Uh, I also want them to get used to the idea of math modeling because I think that's how it's being, the different math courses are being taught now. It's not simply a dry, I mean, I, I imagine there's some places where it still is, but I don't think most math instructors really, um, even in a lecture setting, you know, you make the most of the situation you have, but I think they like to try and, and put in different information or maybe your work that you do to support the class, you're going to have to use data. And certainly when you take statistics, it shouldn't, we need to marry the calculus and the stats, I think a little bit better in terms of these are tool sets you need for different uh, careers you're going to be going into. 
You're always analyzing data. They don't hand you a worksheet and say, here, we'll pay you to do worksheets for a living. That's just not how it works. <laughs> question did you so you're having the students do like so you'll have a sequence of students who've done this activity in all three years of free calculus calculus and then or three terms of whatever like so yeah, they've done it, it three times uh two um the so the pre-calc class th these are all three classes are technically senior classes it is wow. possible that a student takes the bc course as a junior and then would take it again if they wanted the uh, the math modeling elective. So that is possible. Um, but I like having slightly different variations of it too, so that, okay, I may be redoing the simulation, but there's more to be gained from it than what you did at the previous level. And so it's really, it's like the trajectory isn't really like consistent. So you'll have some students in the class who have done it before and some who haven't done it before. Correct. In fact, I have a young, um, the requirement actually is only calculus and we have both AP and non AP calculus. Not everybody wants to take an AP course and that's fine, but they do want to learn calculus. And depending on what you want to study in college, um, business majors need to study calculus at, uh, and somewhat admittedly, we look at what the University of Delaware is doing because that's where many of our kids go there. The in-state tuition rate is, is a very good deal, I have to say. Um, but the, um, the business majors take it, your medical majors and nursing majors have to take a, a level of calculus. Then there's the engineers and your scientists and your computer programmers and so on. And they're not all necessarily taking the version equivalent to what AP offers in their AB course um, for Calc 1. And some majors, they want Calc 1, other majors, they want Calc 1 and Calc 2. Um, so again, depending on where you wanna go, um, you may, some people want to take BC in addition to AB and others, okay, AB was enough. Um, and then we have quite a few people who take AP stats, which is good. And um, I, I think that's something, one of the things I enjoy about going to conferences like this and listening to what people are doing at the next level, um, it, the importance of being able to handle the data and you need the stats for that. It's it, the data may be great for modeling and helping you use your techniques from calculus and differential equations. But I think that whole concept of um, how do you gather the data because data collection and how it's collected and the circumstances and the conditions that you use, that is just as important as your processing. Because if you haven't, you know, if it's poorly collected or, um, what's supposed to be random isn't, then you, know, you have some problems there. So um, again, that's something that I get to bring back to the department and go, okay, hey, you know, <laughs> we need this. <laughs> we also have a research course that the students have to take as a graduation requirement and they have to conduct an experiment. And I think the more that we can help them with that and give them access to good data sets, the better off they're going to be with that aspect too. So, how much time did it take to your students to, from start to the end, from collecting the data to presenting the final result? Okay, so good question. Um, our class periods are 80 minutes. And so usually, um, I, I, the BC course, I'd say we spent two classes in terms of collecting and then completing the analysis and write-up, there was a break in there of a third class to actually go over the technique to, to, to do the partial fractions and, and solve it. So like I said, we had part one, took a pause, came back, came back, did part two. The pre-calc, um, we spent a week, about three or four days, and that was a little bit more spread out. Um, and then the, uh, the DEQ group, because of the nature of what we're doing at the population unit, we've spent two days on it, collecting data, and then going over some of the terminology and looking at some things. And then we'll probably do one more. Um, what's a phase portrait? How is that different from a slope field? What does it tell you? That kind of thing. But um, it's roughly what we're looking at. Yeah, different time scale for different class levels. 
this is what you need to keep in mind. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have to meet the kids where they are and, and go at a pace that they can handle it so that you can really expand upon it. Because I think once, once the kids understand that they're thinking and they're using what's in front of them, it, it, oh, you know, the, the light bulb goes off and there's different things they can do with it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah.